Let's make our confession of faith, okay? Say it with me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. Today, I will be taught the uncompromised Word of God. My mind is alert, and my heart is receptive. I will not leave the same as I came in Jesus' name. And every time I come to Church on the Rock, my faith and my life get stronger and stronger. One more time, please. Give God all the glory. Give God all the glory. Amen. Well, open your Bible to Psalm chapter 42. In our Bible study today, I want to talk to you about what do you do when it feels hopeless? What do you do when it feels hopeless? Right now, going through COVID, all of us have experienced that hopelessness. Pastor Kim even prayed by the gifts of the Spirit that someone was here or online or outside where it looked like your dream has died, and she encouraged you by the Holy Spirit, don't let that happen, don't believe that, because when God begins something, he'll finish it in your life. Amen. So, so we're talking about today and next weekend, we're talking about what do you do when it feels hopeless? Hopelessness is a terrible thing. People without hope in the future always retreat to their past. People without hope in the future have no power for the present. Someone said that hope is the oxygen to the soul, our emotions. Without hope, our emotions are like a roller coaster. So I want to talk to you about what do you do when it feels hopeless? I heard someone the other day, in fact, they were a member of our church and my heart went out to them. But they said, I'm just keeping my head above water during COVID. I just want to get by. Well, I love you so much. I can't leave, leave you like that, Lucille, right? I can't leave you like that because that's not God's will for us to struggle through COVID. It's not God's will for us to barely make it with our head above water. That's a victim mentality. That's a barely get through mentality. And my brother and sister, if you are a Christian, if you're born again, the greater one lives on the inside of you. And if God be for you, who can dare stop you today? So we should be asking ourselves, God, what do you want me to learn during COVID? God, where do you want me to grow during COVID? God, who can I help? Who can I serve during COVID? We should be asking ourselves, how can I make a difference with my life? How can I develop my gifts and talents to a new level during COVID? Not getting by, not struggling through, not barely making it. That is not my Bible. That is not God's will for our life. Can I have a witness in the house today? So I want to talk to you. But, but with that said, we all go through times of hopelessness. Uh, I remember many of you know our testimony. Stephen, uh, our youngest, when he was born 30-some years ago uh, here in St. Louis, we had him at the St. Louis Luke's Hospital, and they told us he wouldn't live. He was premature, that it looked really, really hopeless for us. Uh, I, I can go back and look at Kim and I 47 years together, and there are many things I could share with you today that we face as a couple and a family that looked hopeless. As a pastor of this church for 37 years, there are many times that it looked like there was no way, but we sang it, God's a way maker. God is a way maker. It may look like today there's no way for you. It may look like a dead end. It may look like you've lost all your options. It may look like your best days are behind you, but I'm here on assignment to equip you through COVID, not to entertain you. I am not an entertainer, but I am here to equip you today to go through what you're going through and come out successfully as an overcomer. Come out not as a loser, but as a lifelong learner. Can I have another witness? And I love to hear you say amen. Amen. So, so we're going to look at David, King David. And I love this psalm, Psalm 42, because we all can identify, we all can relate to this psalm, because David is feeling hopeless. King David, he's feeling hopeless, He's feeling like that his dynasty is over, that his destiny is to an end. David is, in Psalm 42, he's devastated, he's depressed, he's discouraged, uh, he's anxious, he's worrying, he's fearful, 
You see why, Pastor? Because his own son, Absalom, has been plotting and planning to take over his kingdom for four years. David is running from his own son, his own kin, his own family, Absalom. Absalom has betrayed his father, King David, and for four years he's plotted and schemed to bring him down. Uh, Beyond that, also, David's chief of staff, who was Bathsheba's father. Remember Bathsheba? Uh, Bathsheba's father was the chief of staff for David. Well, he betrayed David, and he went to be chief of staff for Absalom. And now he is after, with an army, King David. So King David is running seemingly from his destiny, his dream, and his call. King David, his own family, is out to kill, steal, and destroy him and his kingdom. Those on his staff, those on his team, his inner circle has betrayed him. It looks like he's at a dead end. It looks like his best days are behind him. He's asking himself questions. What did I do to deserve this? You know, I just want to encourage you today here in this room and those online and outside in the drive-in church. You know, we make mistakes, and a lot of times it's our own fault. But even when it's our fault, even because of poor decisions or poor seeds that we've sown, you know what? My Bible says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them out of all. God delivers them out of all. So whether we're entrapped today by those who are opposing us and persecuting us over nothing, or it's our own fault that we're in the mess we're in today, I'm here to tell you that we serve a good God, and God will deliver us. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a praise. So I I can relate. You can relate that he's going through hopelessness. He, He sees that he has no future. He's wondering why his family is trying to kill him. He's lost his dynasty, he thinks. He's lost his kingdom, he thinks. A dead end, no options. It's over. His best days are behind him. He's struggling struggling emotionally. He's struggling with his faith and trust in God. I think we can all relate. I think we can all relate. I think it resonates with all of us. There are those times and seasons, and maybe today's one of them, where we're questioning God, we're questioning ourselves, we're questioning the Word. We're wondering why, we're wondering what, we're wondering how. Well, I I, want to help you today. What do you do, pastor? What do you do when, when it looks like the bottom has fallen out? It looks like there's no way. It looks like all my options are gone. It looks like I have no friends. It looks like I have no support system. What do you do? Golden nugget, big idea I want you to leave with today. Learn to counsel yourself. Learn to counsel yourself. When you're depressed, despondent, struggling with your emotions, learn to counsel yourself. Now, we believe in counseling at Church on the Rock. We, uh, our staff counsels, and now, now we're not professional counselors, so uh, we, we won't get into the particulars, but we will give you the word and we will pray with you and stand with you. Uh, we have Celebrate Recovery every Thursday night. We help people. We counsel people. We have a list of professional uh, psychologists in our church and other churches to help people. We believe in counseling. We believe in programs and process. But, but I think sometimes God eliminates that kind of scaffolding in our life. So we'll turn to him. And we'll look to him and him alone. I remember uh, it was 37 years ago uh, that when next year, when Stephen, our youngest, I told you earlier, when we started Church on the Rock in November, he was born in February. And, and the doctors even told me the night he was born, honestly, if I'm, if I'm lying, I'm frying. They said, don't even worry about his birth certificate. Don't worry about a name. He's not going to make it overnight. He's going to die. Uh, well, at that time, you have to understand that we came to plant this church with 35 people in the St. Peter's Library 37 years ago. We left our denomination to come do this. Our denomination that, that we were raised in, went to college, got, got certified, got licensed, got ordained through that denomination. So, so when we, and we love that denomination to this day, but when we left that denomination to come and start a non-denominational church, many of those people turned on us. 
And I, I, I don't have any grudges, especially after 37 years. It was just misunderstanding. They didn't understand. But they wrote letters saying that we were a cult and that we were out of God's will and that we basically had gone crazy, become a fanatic. So we lost all of our friends. And and, and in fact, some of our family, not all of our family, but some of our uh, uh, extended family members thought we were crazy as well. How could you leave a denomination with security, hospital plan, medical plan? Uh, You've been there, gone to college, got the license, got the ordination. How could you leave your denomination and go start a little piddly 35-member church, Ananda? They thought we were crazy. So at that time, when the doctor said that night Stephen was going to die and not make it through the night, I didn't have my pastor friends I used to have. I didn't have some of our family, extended family members that we used to have. They thought we were crazy and they weren't talking to us. I didn't have, I didn't have the scaffolding, the support system I used to have. And so I found out on that dark, dreary day, the next day, when I had to go down to St. Luke's to see Stephen in an incubator, and Kim said, go pray over him. He'll live. On the way down, terrible. Of all things, it was raining. I got a ticket. I was speeding of all days. It was dark. It was dreary. We felt like we were alone. There was nobody we could call to counsel, to help, to support. So, so what did we learn right then and there? We're going to have to learn to counsel yourself. Because sometimes the people you depended on aren't there. In fact, in this psalm, David says, the ones that I went to the the temple with have betrayed me. What are we saying? Christian brothers and sisters that he went to church with betrayed him and weren't even there to support him any longer. There are those times in our life, I found out, where, where the best friend's not there, or the pastor can't come see me, uh, my family members don't understand me. There are those times where it seems like you're all alone, and it's at those times we have to run to God. And we have to learn to counsel ourselves. I think that's part of the process, don't y'all, of growing up spiritually mature. Now, with that said, we need one another. Don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We need one another. At Church of the Rock, we are pro people. We are pro people. The most important things in life are not things, they are relationships. Uh, We are small group people. We are uh, watch party people. We are get involved in a ministry. I mean, relationships are huge. We need one another. Especially in the last days, we need fellowship like never before. But with all that said, sometimes the people you counted on aren't there. Sometimes the people you want to connect with, you can't find. Sometimes it seems like you're all by yourself. But I want to encourage you, if you've got God, you're never by yourself. And so David, what did he have to do? He had to learn to counsel himself. So that's the big idea, and that's the big thought. Is that okay with everybody? So I, I want to show you how to do that. Pastor, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. I'm new to all this. Counsel myself. How do I lift myself up? How do I give myself hope? How do I change my emotions, my thinking? How do I change the mood and the atmosphere in my home, my house, my car, my truck? How do I get things to change for the better? Where do I start? What do I do? How do I get my family back, my marriage back, my health back? How do I get my career back? How do I get my joy back? How do I get my hope back? I want to help you with that today. I I, I want to equip you and help you with that today. So follow with me. We're we're going to go to Psalm 42, and we're going to look at verse 1. I'm going to read just through verse 8 this today. Next weekend, we'll finish it. But out of this chapter, there are 10 things David did to counsel himself. There are 10 things that took him from hopelessness and gave him hope. There are 10 things that David did, 10 uh, action steps that he did that took him from sorrow to joy, from sickness to health, from, from, from lack to wealth, from confusion to clear direction, 10 things that he did. I, I want to share just a few with you today, but if you allow me, let's just begin. As the deer panteth after the water, brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Now, if you're a note taker, I would encourage you to write this down. The very first thing that he says is he said that that through these times, I've let my relationship with God slip. That's what he's saying. 
He's saying that, that through the turmoil and the heartache and the opposition and the attack and all that's happening through my own son, my own family, my own regime, my own kingdom, uh, through all of this, I've kind of let my, my habits slip. I've kind of let my walk with God slip. I want to encourage you that if you want to counsel yourself, number one, you're going to have to make God priority over soccer, baseball, ballet, uh, over gymnastics, over hobbies, over job, over career, over all. We're going to have to make, like you all are doing today, we're going to have to make God priority. We're going to have to run after God like the deer after the water. We're going to have to make God first. We're going to have to make God priority. He's going to have to come first every morning of every day of our life if we're going to learn to counsel ourselves. Because when we get in a predicament and we get in a problem and we're under pressure and we're being accused and persecuted and opposed, we need revelation from God to get out of the situation. And the revelation is only going to come by being in his presence, by being in his presence. So David said, as the deer pants after the water, so you need to chase, be a God chaser, go after God. He's got to come before your wife, your husband, your kids, your dog, your cat, and your hamster. He's got to be first. Now, I know that's not our culture today, but that's the Bible. I really don't care about our culture. All right. Verse two, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears, watch this now, family. My tears have been my meat day and night. I don't get it, Pastor. What's that mean? My tears have been my food day and night. I still don't get it, Pastor. What's he saying? My tears have been my meat day and night. No, I don't get it, Pastor. What's he saying? He's feeding on his emotions. Tears, emotions, crying. He's feeding on his emotions. And as long as I feed on the hurt, the hurt's going to hurt. As long as I feed on my past, the past is going to get bigger, worse. As long as I feed on uh, the things I shouldn't feed on, they're going to get bigger. So what's he been feeding on? His emotions. If you and I are going to counsel ourselves, we're going to have to control our emotions and not let our emotions control us. Now, I know that's difficult sometimes, but thanks be unto God, we have the Holy Spirit to help us. So he's been feeding on his emotions while they continually say unto me, where is your God? Look at this. He's focusing on what other people are saying. He's focusing on what other people are saying. My tears have been, my emotions, I've been feeding on my emotions, focusing on my emotions. When I remember these things, look at verse 4, family. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, that's his emotions, for I have gone with the multitude. Now, what is he saying in verse 4? He's looking back, and he's living right now with regret. He's saying, I wish I could go back, but he can't go back. There have been times I know for you and for me during COVID, I wish we could go back to March, but we can't go back. And the good news is God doesn't want us to live in the past. God wants us to believe that our future is better than our past. Amen, somebody. So he said, when I remember those things, I pour out my soul, my emotions. I've gone with a multitude. I went with them to the house of God. I went to church and with a voice of joy and praise with a multitude. And we kept the holy days. We kept the Sabbath. Why are you cast down? Verse 5. Notice he's talking to himself. We're talking about learning how to counsel yourself. And, and he's talking to himself, and he's asking a question. You know, I think it's good sometimes that when you and I are going through difficult times, we should start asking ourselves questions. Instead of, uh, why did they do that to me? I should be asking myself the question, oh, God, what do you want me to be doing now? God, what can I do to bring healing? God, what can I do to get rid of the depression and bring the joy? I, I think there's no recovery. I have counseled for 45 years. I think there's no recovery until you can get people to ask themselves questions. I, I think the greatest breakthrough comes not when I tell you what's wrong or not when you tell me what's wrong, but when I discover it for myself what's wrong. Am I helping anybody today? If you want real transformation, if you want real counsel that will bring correction and change, I have to ask myself the hard questions. 
I have to ask myself the hard questions. So David is asking himself, why are you depressed? Why are you devastated? Why are you despondent? Why are you disquieted in me? And then what does he say? He's counseling himself now. Then he says, I'm going to put my hope in God. Well, that's key right there. When we get our eyes off others, when we get our eyes off our past, when we get our eyes off our mistakes, and we get our eyes on God. And he said, I'm going to hope in you, God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Verse 6, oh, my God, my soul is depressed. I'm despondent. I'm devastated. I'm hurting. Therefore, will I remember thee from the land of Jordan, the Hermonites, and the hill of Mazar. Verse 7, deep calls unto deep at the noise of the water spouts. What is that, Pastor? I'm new to all of this. What does that mean? He's talking here about a spiritual experience, a deep spiritual experience. Water unto water, deep unto deep. None of the surface, you know, Christian candy stuff. Getting real with God, getting deep with God, and deep calls unto deep, the noise of the water spouts and your billows gone over me. Verse 8. Here's what I wanted to get to. Y'all ready? Three things to do today that, that can bring transformation that will help me counsel myself when, when there's no one there. I have to learn how to counsel myself. I have to learn how to make things happen and turn things around and bring change into my life and my family, my home and my environment. Uh, where do I start? Where do I begin, Pastor? Pastor, I'm hurting today. They're in COVID. People have hurt me. They've said things. I'm sorry about that as your pastor. But I can help you. I can equip you to get through it. How do you do it, Pastor? Where do you start? Three things right here David said. Three things that David said will bring him hope in God. I love this. Three things that will give him hope. Three things that will bring him hope. Three things that will bring change the negative into a positive. Three things that will bring sadness will go and joy will come. Hopelessness will leave and hope will come. Weakness will go and strength will come. Confusion will leave and clarity will come. Where do we start, Pastor? Number one, he said the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. Number one, what is that? His loving kindness is his love. How do I do that, Pastor? Number one, how to counsel ourselves when we're hurting. It seems like there's nobody there to help us. Here it is. Number one, meditate and focus on how much God loves you every day, throughout the daytime. You stop when you're shaky, when you're weak, when you're anxious, when you're panicking, when you're wondering, when you're struggling emotionally, or when you're asking yourself questions and you're trying to find the right answers because real recovery comes through self-discovery. Real recovery comes through self-discovery. When you can get someone to discover it for themselves, they tend to receive it more than when you tell them what's wrong with them. And you get them to self-discover by asking them questions. And so he, he, the Lord commanded, so number one, you and I can go through recovery. You and I can get hope back. You and I can get clarity back by what? Stopping. Look at that. Daytime. Everyone say daytime. Daytime. Throughout the day, throughout the day, Stop and look at his loving kindness. Throughout the day, stop and meditate and focus on how much God really loves you. Now, we know God is love, right, Church on the Rock? We know God is love, and we know that his love is eternal. And we know that his love is unlimited. And we know that his love is unconditional. And we know that his love is eternal. And we know that his love is extravagant. And we know that his love draws us to him. He said in Jeremiah, I draw you to me through my loving kindness. Oh, I love it. But, but let me just break this down for you. Uh, uh, that You need to understand a little bit more about that love. We need to pray and ask God, God, give us a revelation. Because he talks about, oh, that you would know the depth, the height, the width, the breadth of his love. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about? In Philippians chapter 3, that prayer, oh, that you would be rooted and grounded and that you would get a revelation of the depth, the height, the width, the breadth of God's love for you. And that's my prayer for you today as your pastor who loves you. That's my prayer for you at home, at office, in the park, in the backyard, wherever you are today, is that you get a revelation of how much God really loves you. Now, uh, let me get, break this down for you. Uh, uh, I think it's going to help you. You know, the Bible says that, that the Trinity loves one another. What? The Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It talks about how they have a love for one another. Pastor, where's that at? Book of John, Gospel of John. Read it sometime. It, it says the Son loves the Father and the Father loves the Son. It, it, Jesus said that what I see the Father doing, I do. And what I see the Father saying, I say. So, so there's a love between the Trinity that, that, that's, that, that's not like any other kind of love. And then number two, uh, God loves the world. There's a love for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe on him would not perish but have eternal life. Am I right, church? So, so there's a love. God has a love for the world. Question how does God love the world? How does God love the world? You know, in a few weeks, we're going to have Sean McDowell in person on Sunday here on the stage. And I've asked Sean McDowell, Josh McDowell's son. Sean's been here before. I've asked him to come and teach on how do we defend our faith in 2020? How do we teach our children and our, and our college students? How do we teach our, our high school students? How do we teach adults how to defend their faith in the fall of 2020? That's coming up. But, but, it, but it's so, so important that you and I understand that God loves the world, but how does he love the world? Two ways, through warning the world. Through warning the world. What do you mean? All the prophecies that are going to happen if the world doesn't receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, if I really care about people, if I just came down the street and I found, found out that the bridge is out, so I had to turn around and go back. If I see somebody in a car going that way, I'm going to stop. If I really care about them, I'm going to warn them. I'm going to stop them and say, no, no, don't go down that road. The bridge is out. Well, God loves the world through and by warning the world that without Christ, you're going to hell. But with Christ, you could go to heaven and spend eternity with him in a mansion, ruling and reigning over cities and states and nations and universes throughout the eons of time. The second way that God loves the world is through the gospel. God loves the world through the gospel. But don't forget our point, how we get hope back is we stop every day, like David said, and we meditate on how much God loves us. But the second way that God loves the world is through the preaching of the gospel. We, we do it here now, Church on Demand, 724. The gospel is the Bible. It's the good news. And how does God love the world? By warning the world. And number two, by sending people to preach and teach the gospel. But now let me give you to the third kind of God's love. God loves his own. God loves his own. Now, I, 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 may, I may love your regret, I mean your kids, but I really love my own. Come on, you know what I'm talking about, mom and dad? Yeah, I mean, isn't it amazing how your child as a baby was the cutest child in the whole hospital, right? All right? So it's just natural. And so God, God loves his own uh, in a different way than he loves the world, God loves his own. Who's his own? Christians. Who's his own? As Josh comes out, sons and daughters of the Most High God, believers, born-again people. God loves them in a way he does not love the world. God loves his own in a way that he doesn't love the world. Now, when God the Father loved the Son, and God the Son loved the Father, God the Father came to the Son and said, I want to give to you a redeemed humanity. And God the Son says, Father, I love you so much, and thank you so much. I want a family. I will pay the price of sacrifice to redeem that family. And so we see that love between the Trinity. We see God's love for the world. But my brother and sister, there's a love for his own that the world cannot have. 
And that is found in John chapter 13 at the Last Supper when he's washing their feet. And he says this, I've loved you, Jesus said, I loved you to the end. I've loved you to the end. And we think uh, to the end of him going to the cross. That's not what it means. In the Greek, it says, I've loved you to the max. I've loved you with all my capacity to love. This is Jesus. He said, I've loved you to the fulfillment of my capacity. I've loved you to the maximum. Uh, there's a love God has for you and for me. It's agape. There's a love that God has for his own that the world can't get until they come into his family. I'm telling you that God is for you today. I'm telling you that God loves you today. I'm telling you that God has a future for you today. I'm telling you that whatever mess we've got ourselves in, God will deliver us today. Can we give God praise? The second thing, watch this now, to get hope back, is he said, and in the night. So during the daytime, everyone say daytime. During the daytime, what are we to do? Focus on God's love for you. But at night, what are we to do? Sing praise. In the nighttime, sing a song. Sing a song of deliverance. Sing a song of breakthrough. Sing a song of thanksgiving. Sing a song of praise. He inhabits the praises of his if you want him to show up in your bedroom, start singing praise to him in the middle of the night. If you want God to inhabit your house in the middle of the night when those harassing, tormenting, horrific thoughts come to taunt and tempt and harass you, all of a sudden just begin to sing some praise out to God and it will still the enemy. It'll paralyze the devil in his tracks. So, so what do we do uh, to get hope back? Well, during the day, no matter what people are saying, no matter what our emotions are doing and what we're struggling with, just stop throughout the day and say, God loves me and put your name in there. Make it personal. Psychologists tell us that when you make something personal, you're more apt to receive it. So make it personal. Put your name. Number two, at night, you and I, what we want to do is sing praises unto him. It'll get your hope back. I love that. And then number three, and my prayer unto God of my life. What is that? Develop a prayer life. Develop a prayer life. We can help you with that. We've got classes, we've got modules, we've got teaching. Pastor, I'm new to this. I don't know how to pray. Well, you know where I would say to you as your pastor who loves you? Just start talking to God. What? Yeah, just start talking to God. Just start fellowship. What is fellowship? Two fellows in a ship. Just start talking to God. Just tell God how you feel. Listen, there are 150 psalms. 50 of them are called lamenting psalms. Did you know that? 50 of the 150 psalms are called lamenting. What's the word lament mean? Well, it's in the Bible, Jeremiah and Lamentations. Lament means to cry out and complain. Notice that 50 of the 150 psalms is the psalmist crying out to God and complaining and asking for help. Uh, here's where you start. God knows how we feel anyway. Why don't we just tell him? Why don't we just share with him where we're hurting, our questions, what we're going through? And he sees our heart. And with an honest, humble heart, he hears it. And I believe he'll give us revelation to make the changes we need to make to get the change we want. From hopelessness to a life of hope. So in conclusion, three things. Number one, I forgot. What are we going to do every day during the daytime? Stop and focus on what? The love, the love, the love, the love of God. Number two, what are we going to do? At night, what are we going to do? We're going to sing praises unto God. And then number three, what are we going to do? We're going to work on a prayer life. We're going to work on our fellowship with God. And a double dog dare you, and I believe when you do it, it's going to get hopelessness out of your life, and it's going to bring hope back into your life. Y'all get something? I'm out of time. Give the Lord all the praise, would you? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Stand up with me, would you please? Everybody standing. Please don't leave yet outside. Stay with me online. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want us to pray this prayer for anybody. Here's the gospel now. Here's the warning now. Here's God loving the world. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're not right with God, please get right with God today. He loves you. 
He sent his son to die for you. He wants to redeem us from destruction. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Or you might be a believer and you say, Pastor, I, I've, let, I've let things slip with God like, like David did. And David said the first thing of getting hope back is get back with God. Get back in tune. Get my priorities in sync. Uh, don't let slip the most important thing. And that's time with God. Pastor, I want to rededicate, recommit my life to God today. Uh, we're going to lead you in a prayer with our heads bowed. Let's everybody here outside online, for those who are making this decision, let's say it together. Heavenly Father, I repent. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for me and he rose again. Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Take my life and make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all can look up. Let's celebrate with the angels in heaven. Thanks for watching this week's message. Here at Church on the Rock, our purpose is to help you know God better. And one of those ways is through Growth Track. We have a four-step process online that you can take anytime or maybe consider joining us in person. But to take your next step and to find out all the incredible things we have to offer here at Church on the Rock, I encourage you to go over to cotr.org slash online or you can email us at online at cotr.org. And never forget, God is for you.